Hello, my name is Peter Abiel, and welcome to the Robot Brains podcast, a show about AI and robots and the brilliant brains who make them. Today here with me is Andre Karpathy. Andre is the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Autopilot Vision at Tesla. He's one of the world's leading visionaries in deep learning and computer vision. Ever since his PhD days at Stanford, back when deep learning was just starting to emerge as a viable technology, Andre has not only been a leading researcher, but also a leading educator. From there, he became one of the founding members of OpenAI, the AI research organization in San Francisco, initially largely funded by Elon Musk. And from there, at some point, Elon Musk, they recruited Andre to head up autopilot efforts at Tesla. Andre, uh, you and I used to spend so much time together. For listeners, Andre and I used to work together at, at OpenAI, but we also used to see each other at all of the AI conferences, academic working groups. But now it's actually been quite a while since we've seen each other, and <laughs> so I'm excited to get to catch up. I'm not even sure when is the last time we saw each other. Maybe NERPS, maybe my wedding, maybe covariant offices. Do you remember? I do. It was just before the pandemic, I think. Right before pandemic. Must have been at NERPS in Vancouver. I remember the burgers we went to eat in this uh, dive bar across the conference center. Yep. And of course, I visited Covariant and saw your offices and uh, we had a chance to talk there. Which was a lot of fun. I hope we can host you again sometime soon. I actually spent most of yesterday watching all the videos listed on your website. Absolutely brilliant what you've achieved and how you explain it there. Now, can you tell our listeners a little bit about how you went from Slovakia age 15, to becoming Tesla's AI director? That's a quite all-encompassing question. Yeah, it's a long story. So as you mentioned, my parents decided to immigrate to Canada when I was 15. Yeah, I was not a very happy sort of person in Slovakia. I always wanted to leave. Uh, Slovakia is uh, not an incredibly ambitious place. I felt that um, I was upper bounded in terms of what I can achieve there. And so I always wanted to go to Canada, America, and uh, do something substantial. When they kind of hinted that we may be able to go to Canada, I was on board instantly. And then my sister was not quite as on board and you know everyone else in the family as well. But I sort of worked to convince everyone and make the move. We came to Canada, I started in high school. I barely spoke any English. I had to learn English. I was very good at math. Luckily, the Slovakian curriculum is quite uh, good at math. And so I was able to sort of get into their good courses and go through high school, join the University of Toronto and kind of get into computer science and, and so on. Uh, it is a long story. <laughs> it is a long story, but I think there are some really interesting parts to it. For example, somewhere I read that um, Jeff Hinton of Toronto is the one who first showed you neural networks. Yeah, so in the University of Toronto is when I first came into contact sort of with deep learning through Jeff Hinton's class. And he taught a class, and at the time, this was a very, very simple primordial deep learning. So we were looking at little digits, white on black, three, two, four, one, and we we're trying to recognize you know those digits. And so by today's standards, these were incredibly toy problems. I was fascinated by the way that Jeff Hinton spoke about these algorithms. He kept making analogies to the human brain and you know the, the way he talked about the neural net, it was like in the mind of the network. And he kept using these anthropomorphic descriptions for what was going on in the algorithm. And I found that analogy fascinating. And so that's kind of what pulled me in, I would say, into the entire area. And then I audited the class and I also went to some of the reading groups that he hosted with his students. And that's basically when I became extremely interested in deep learning and have been in deep learning since. Now, if we jump ahead a little bit, I think the first time you really were very visible as somebody in uh, deep learning was during your PhD days at Stanford when you were the one who were generating a lot of the research progress and educational content. How do you get going on that at Stanford? Yeah, so I think you're alluding to CS231N, the class that I ended up basically designing to a very large extent and then being the primary instructor for uh, together with Fei Fei. And it was really the first deep learning class at Stanford and became extremely successful. So in the first offering, it was maybe 150 students or so. And by the time I left, it was 700 or so. And so this became one of the biggest classes at Stanford. And the way it came about, I've always had a passion for teaching. And even during my master's degree at University of British Columbia, TAing different classes was always the highlight of my experience. I just love watching people learn new skills and then go out and do cool things with those skills. I feel like it's such a large lever 
over kind of impact. It's indirect, but I think it's a very large lever. I was really, you know, just very passionate about teaching in general. And deep learning at the time was starting to have some of its first successes. Uh, so in 2012, we had the first convolutional neural network uh, give a stunning performance on this ImageNet benchmark in uh, computer vision and image classification. And a lot of people suddenly paid a lot of attention to deep learning. And I happened to uh, be in a place where I understood the technology and I was very passionate about uh, teaching. And Feifei approached me and she pitched me on the idea that, hey, we could start a class and actually teach people about this. I instantly jumped at the idea. I loved it. I uh, put my entire PhD in research on hold. It's not something you would typically want to do as a PhD student because your primary output is research. And I ended up not doing basically any research for maybe a year uh, because I just focused on the class and its design. But I felt like it was probably more impactful than getting a paper or two out to actually like do this class and do a good job of it. And yeah, so we came up with the curriculum and taught it and it was amazing. And it was probably the highlight of my PhD. So Andre, I mean, a lot of people already know this, but some people probably don't. I mean, you're saying this class went from 150 to 700 students from year one to year two. But the reality is much bigger than that, of course. I mean, this class was put on YouTube and there were hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of people watching your lectures because it wasn't just the first Stanford class. It was the class that everybody was watching, following along because deep learning was this new thing and it was the place you would go if you wanted to understand it. You had to go to Andre Karpathy's class. That That's where everybody went. I just want to <laughs> clarify, there's more than 700 people who <laughs> were active in that class. Yeah, absolutely. I did think it had a larger reach than I had anticipated at the time, of course, by a lot. People come up to me randomly in conferences and even in like in a coffee shop and tell me that they've uh, you know, they saw my class and they really enjoyed it. And I've heard it many times, but it always 